Hi, my name is Lavinia. This is Peter. Welcome to Games Made Easy. Today, I'm very excited to teach you and give you some tips on how to play Dune, Chome and Richesse House Expansion, published by Gale Force 9. Apart from the two new factions, what I like in this expansion is how much more depth and variety there is while still remaining true to the base game. If you want to learn how to play the base game or the advanced rules of the base game, watch my other videos. And if you enjoy this video, consider subscribing and clicking the like button and the bell to get notified when I post new videos. It helps a lot. This expansion of Dune introduces two new factions, the Chome Corporation, the largest single source of wealth in the Imperium and House Richess, known throughout the Imperium as the manufacturer of machines. You also have new leader skill cards you can assign to your leaders, and you can also use advanced stronghold cards to gain an advantage when battling in a stronghold you control. With this expansion, like with the base game, you still have 10 turns to defeat your opponents. Before I go further, I'll explain what these two new factions bring to the game, starting with Chom, which stands for Combine, Onet, Ober, Advanced, or Mercantile, and then we'll look at House Richess. Chom has weak leaders, but they control much of the economic affairs across the universe, and have a keen interest in Arrakis above and beyond spice production. Chom makes for a powerful ally, as they can trade treachery cards with their ally, and also pay for their ally's forces in battle. They connect more during the Chome charity phase and can also change how that phase works. Finally, they make worthless cards valuable. House Richess, just like the Ixians, have a well-earned reputation for ingenuity and create important technological inventions. Since being ousted from governing Arrakis, they are reduced to selling off important creations simply to raise enough funds to continue their efforts to compete. They start with no forces on Arrakis, but they have their own Richess treachery deck which they can sell and also influence the auction of the treachery cards. They can also use the no field to hide the number of forces shipped to Arrakis, even from the Atreides. Now I'll explain the new game mechanics that the expansion adds to the base game. After that, I'll explain the specific rules for each faction. To set up this expansion, start by adding the new cards to the base game. In this expansion, there are 11 new traitor cards, which you add to the traitor deck as usual, remove all the treachery cards for the factions not playing this game and the auditor if you're not playing advanced rules. Two prediction cards to add to the Bene Gesserit prediction deck. Two alliance cards, which you keep aside with the others. There's also 14 treachery cards. If you're playing the Ixion and Tleilaxo expansion, replace the Poison Tooth and the Artillery Strike cards with those from this expansion. There's also two updated Karama cards marked with this hand, which replace those from the base game. Shuffle the new treachery deck with those new cards. The other 10 treachery cards marked with the Richess icon are given to the Richess player. This expansion adds two new variants you can use with the base game, irrespective of which factions you play. One is a home field advantage when you're attacked in a stronghold you occupy, and the other gives more powers to your leaders. Both are really cool. To use the leader skill cards, change the setup a little. After the Bene Gesserit have made their prediction and the distribution of the treachery cards, deal two of the 14 leader skill cards to each faction. Each player keeps one. Then shuffle the others back into the leader skill deck. Show the card you keep face up in front of you and assign it to one of your leaders by placing the disc next to the card. Each card has a unique name and a special effect described on top here. These six give you a straight up bonus and those eight special advantages in specific aspects of the game. All also have a special advantage to be used if this leader is in battle. A leader's skill stays active as long as its assigned leader is alive. You use it before a faction ability, like the Mentat skill before a trade's prescience. As for the battle advantage, you use it when you must pick a leader for battle. At this stage, you either leave the skilled leader where it is, or take it with its card behind your screen. If you pick that skilled leader to battle, place it on your wheel with the skilled card. The first part of the skill is an effect, and you can also use the battle advantage at the bottom of the card. When a skill mentions a card type, like Poison Weapon, you must include that card in the battle plan to gain its bonus. If you bring the skilled leader card behind your screen, but end up using another leader on your battle, then you can't use any of the skills from your leader skill card. If, however, you decide to leave your skilled leader in front of your shield, the first part of the skill can be used by the other leader in battle. If the skilled leader is killed, then you will have to reshuffle the skill card into the leader skill deck. When you revive a leader, 
If you do not already have a leader skill card, you can draw two new cards and pick one to place in front of your shield with the newly revived leader. If your skilled leader is captured, then the skill card will go with him. After the battle, if you did not use the skilled leader, you place it back in front of this screen. Now let's look at the six stronghold cards. There's one for each stronghold and they're only used with the advanced rules. You can use them if you are the only faction occupying a stronghold. They all have a unique advantage and the card for the Ixian Hidden Mobile Stronghold lets you use the power of another stronghold of your choice. These cards provide home field advantages. During the Mentat phase, these cards are passed on to each player who is the sole occupant of the corresponding stronghold. Now, Bene Gesserit's advisors do not count as occupying forces. At the end of the turn, if the player has lost control of the stronghold, pass the card to the new player controlling it or set it aside if nobody controls the stronghold anymore. These are all the components of this expansion you can use with any faction of the base game or the Ixin and Tleilaxo expansion. Now let's look at the specific components and base rules for each faction, starting with Chom and how they impact the Chom charity phase. The first way it influences Chom charity is by distributing it. Chom collects two spies for each faction playing. So here, eight spies for a four player game. If another faction claims Chom charity, it is paid by the Chom faction, not the bank. Another way Chom influences charity is through its inflation token. During the Mentat phase, Chom may place the inflation token to either double or cancel the effect of Chom charity for that turn. In the next Mentat phase, flip the token unless it's already been flipped once and you remove it from the game. Keep in mind that the inflation token affects every faction, including Chom. Also, no bribes can ever be paid when the inflation token is on its double side. Also, another advantage of Chom is the way it uses treachery cards. Chom can hold five cards instead of four. At the end of any phase, you can discard duplicate cards from your hand for three spice each. And any worthless cards for two spice each. Instead of taking two spice, you can also discard worthless cards for special effects. Balaset stops a player moving into a territory you occupy. They can still ship. Jabba Cloak protects your forces in one territory when the storm moves. Kulwahad prevents a player to use a Karama card this phase. Cullen move one extra territory during the shipping and movement phase. Trip to Gamon send back one force from another player to his reserve during the Mentat phase. La 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 stops one player from taking free revival during the revival phase. Talking about revival, Chome has a disadvantage here as they have no free revival. However, it's banished by the fact that it has no limits to the number of forces it can revive by paying, and it pays only one spice for each force. Finally, at the end of any phase, Chome can exchange one treachery card with an ally. Chome can also pay for some or all of the ally's forces in battle. It makes them a very strong ally. Now let's look at the base rules for Richesse, which impact the treachery bidding and uh, shipping from off-planet. Let's start with the many ways Richesse impacts the bidding round, as they have to sell one of the personal Richesse treachery cards every bidding round. Put one less card for auction and instead add one of the Richesse treachery cards face up for everyone to see. The Richesse treachery card cannot be bought or acquired by a Karama, but they are discarded with other treachery cards. You collect payment for that card, but if you buy the card, the spice goes to either the Emperor, if they're playing, and if not, to the bank. Also, instead of the normal bidding order, you will decide whether your card will be the first or the last, even before the Ixian bidding advantage. Then decide what type of auction you prefer. It can either be a once-around auction or a silent auction. For the first once-around auction method, pick one player on your right or on your left to respectively go counterclockwise or clockwise. Each player has the opportunity to pass or bid once. Richess is always the last to bid, so you can either let the highest bidder get the card or you can outbid them to buy the card. If everyone has passed, then you can either get the card for free or you can remove it from the game. The other type of auction is the silent auction. Here, every faction allowed to bid, place their bid in their hand, even if it's empty, all reveal at the same time. The highest bid wins the card and storm order breaks ties. Silent auctions can be very lucrative with a lot of players, especially for very attractive cards. If all the factions bid nothing, you can either take the card for free or remove it from the game. Another advantage of Richesse is to hide the forces it's shipping with its no-field tokens, which works like an invisible field. Instead of shipping normally, place a no-field token face down at the destination territory and pay the cost to ship one force. 
You could have zero, three, or five forces without other factions knowing. Keep in mind that you cannot add extra forces to the token, but you can leverage the zeros as while it remains hidden, it will count as one force cost-wise and action-wise, so like collecting two spice per turn. You can even move the token like you would normal forces without revealing it. You may reveal your token before the battle phase if you want, or during the reveal, at which point you flip it and place the force tokens in the territory, or only what you have left in reserve. Either way, you must reveal the no field token when revealing your battle plan. Note that until then, nobody knows the number you've dialed, not even the Atreides. Also, you must reveal no field token caught in a storm or by a worm. If this happens, you lose all its forces. You can never have two no field tokens in play at the same time in Arrakis. Also, you can never play the same token twice in a row, even for your ally. So when you've done using a token, keep it face up in front of your shield until you use the next one. Rishes can also help ship their ally forces from off planet using an available no field token. If you already had a no field token on Arrakis, you must first reveal it. Reveal the forces immediately upon shipping and place the no field token you're using face up in front of your shield until you place another one. Also, if your ally doesn't have a full hand, you can give him a treachery card from your hand at any time. Now let's look at the advanced rules for each faction, starting with Chome. In the advanced game, Chome gets a sixth leader, the Auditor, which is shuffled at the start of the game in the traitor deck. When the Auditor survives a battle, he gets to look at two random cards of the opponent's hand that he did not use in that battle. If the Auditor is killed, he can only audit one random card. The opponent's faction can pay you one spice per card to cancel the audit. Also, you can revive your auditor every round, no matter how many leaders you have in the Tleilaxu tanks. The auditor cannot become a gola for the Tleilaxu, nor can he be captured by the Harkonnens. Finally, the auditor cannot be assigned a leader skill card. Now, another advanced ability of Chome is to collect half the spice rounded down when opponents pay to put forces in battle, unless a traitor is revealed. When Chome pays for forces in battle, they will pay the spice bank. But now let's have a look at Chome's advanced Karama power. You may discard treachery cards, even worthless cards, at any time to gain three spice for each. Let's look at the richest advanced rules, where at the start of the bidding phase, you can put any one of your treachery cards in your hand for auction in the black market. You can do it the standard way or any of your two ways without revealing it. You can lie about it or not, it's up to you. Karama cards cannot be used to acquire this card. If there's no bid for the card, you must keep it. If you sell the card, you collect all the spice, and one less card will be put for auction. If normal bidding was used, the next bidding proceeds normally. If once around or silent auctions were used, follow storm order. Also, Richest counts as a fact, and I cannot occupy two eggs each for the Fremen special victory. Finally, let's look at Richest's advanced Karama power. You may pay three spice at any time to buy one of your Richesse treasury cards, secretly choosing which one. My tips to win with the Dune, Chome and Richesse House expansion are Chome has the means to buy some great treachery cards. Remember, there is no such thing as a worthless card for Chome, so buy, go crazy, but plan around them. With Chome, wait until you have shipped enough forces on Dune and you have a strong hand of treachery cards before attacking anyone. Time your Chome inflation tokens properly. Check out what the opponents would stand to benefit from. Richess can make most of its income from selling their treachery cards, so plan them well. Richess should ship with a no-fuel token as much as possible, as it's cheaper, but also it keeps their game hidden. A zero no-fuel token, a weak leader, and a worthless card is a way to weed out your deck, but also to waste another faction's time. So that's how you play this great Dune expansion. These new factions are really cool, with Cho making money and Richess making techs. They add a lot of flavor and uh, dynamic options to create new stories of Dune. If you've enjoyed this video, consider subscribing and clicking the like button. And if you enjoy my content, consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is right here. We'll make more games easy soon. Bye now.